you'll turn to the book of Amos, we're going to pick back up where we left off. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been able to meet because of the snow. And um, didn't want to go two weeks in a row without a service, so even though this week was worse than last week, uh, I decided to go ahead and tough through it. But Amos chapter 5 is where we're at. And the major theme of Amos is the universal justice of God. And we believe that scripture reveals that justice must precede mercy. That God's justice has to be fulfilled before his mercy can be bestowed. This is why Jesus had to die and was the sacrifice to fulfill the justice of God as penalty and payment for sin. That his mercy could come after Jesus Christ. Another major theme in here is that sin has consequences. Sin is not without its consequences. And we are a grace-oriented ministry. We preach about grace an awful lot as we believe that it's the grace of God that saves us and it's incredibly important. But people sometimes miss that the grace of God is not a power to sin. It does not give us the ability to sin, but the grace of God is above sin, and it empowers us, it empowers us over sin. And this is where we talked about in our Bible college class about love constraining us, and my father spoke about it this morning. We are motivated by love, and love will constrain us far more than the law ever could. It will empower us where the law would only give us a standard of what was right and wrong. Love empowers us above the law, greater than the law ever could. My father spoke this morning about a man that beats his wife. All the laws on the books against beating your wife does not stop wife beating in America today or anywhere on the earth. It doesn't stop it. But a love for your wife will immediately bring it to a halt. So a review of where we're at so far in Amos. Amos is writing or speaking before Israel. He is from the southern kingdom and has made this travel to Bethel. And he's speaking to the northern kingdom. Southern guy, northern town, in a city of great education. And here's this country farmer bringing God's message to these people in Bethel. It's a time of prosperity. And as with Israel, we too can be blessed in God's blessings and become complacent as they had become. They had become complacent. They began to believe that their prosperity was due to their good works. And they went after and they started worshiping other gods. In all while they were still receiving prosperity from the Lord. And the reason God allowed prosperity to continue for this time is God is patient with his children. Even when we take for granted his riches that he bestows upon us. Romans 2, 4 was our key verse for this. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God leaves blessing there for a season, for a time in your life that you would self-evaluate and you would bring yourself to repentance before divine discipline has to come in place. And as we said, our God is a just God and sin has consequences. There are consequences for the unbeliever and there is also consequences for the believer that chooses to live in sin. Just as the example here, as in this book of Amos, God is pronouncing judgment on those unbelieving nations and also on his people 
both houses of Israel. Both of them are receiving judgment in this book. But we will see at the end of this book, of this book of Amos, there is a different end to these two judgments, the judgment on the unbeliever and judgment on the people of God. For the unbeliever, judgment is the end. The buck stops there. Judgment is the end. But not so for the believer. Because the judgment upon the believers to bring him to repentance and to bring him back. And there is a promise of restoration for the believer just as there is a promise of restoration for the children of Israel. We studied chapters 3 and 4. We saw that there is a process that God lays out of how his divine discipline works for his children. He is patient, as we said, with Romans 2, 4. And this is to give us time to self-evaluate, to look at our lives and repent on our own. And then he sends words of warning through a prophet, through a friend. He brings it through somebody, words of warning. Then he sends slight correction. And he makes his will very apparent before us, very apparent by this time. And if we refuse all of this, then the hammer drops and full on divine discipline and judgment falls in our lives. And we believe this is up to and including physical death for the believer. I believe a lot of times that this point of sin unto physical death, this is when that person has become destructive to the body of Christ. That's where many times, not the only thing, but one of the main things you'll see that will bring this person to a sin unto physical death. They are being destructive to the body of Christ. Christ. So Amos chapter 5 starting in verse 1. Hear this word and take up over or take hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. So this is said in a lamentation. And what is a lamentation? Lamentation is a expression of intense grief, an extreme expression of sorrow and mourning. And in the Hebrew sense of this word, many times this song is accompanied with beating your chest or banging, beating on drums with this, because this is a musical term. And we do not have, in Western society, an equivalent to what would be a lamentation. We've got the blues, and I love the blues, but it may express sadness, it may express grief, but not to the extent of what a lamentation is. This is sung at a death of a loved one or a funeral. And the closest that I think that I've seen, if I could paint a picture here, of what a lamentation might look like. I had a friend that I worked with, and she managed another store. And we had a meeting in Louisville. So me, my boss, and her car pulled down to Louisville to have our meeting. Now, in my business, it's not uncommon for one of us to get a phone call during one of our meetings, and one of us have to step out the back door quietly and take a call to answer a question from our store. So this morning, we drove down to Louisville. We stopped at Cracker Barrel. We're sitting around the table. We ran into our regional man manager who paid for our breakfast, and we were just talking about our lives and where we grew up, and we were talking about our families and our parents and our kids. Just small talk, and then we went to our meeting. Well, this lady, about an hour into our meeting, she steps out the back door, and none of us thinks of anything. 
And then all of a sudden we hear screaming. And that screaming turns into crying. And me and my boss, we run out the back door and try to find out what's going on. Why is this lady screaming? And she had just gotten news that her father, the, her father we had just talked about earlier that day, her father who she had just seen a week earlier had passed away of a heart attack. And in this deep, deep sadness and just unbelievable pain, she's crying now. We're two hours away from her home where her husband's at. And she's carpooled down. She can't even leave to go back home. So me and my boss, were standing there with her as her husband is driving down to come pick her up. And we're there in, you know, me and my boss, we were not exactly the most, uh, we didn't know what to do. You know, how do you comfort somebody in this, this form? We're not a, very emotional people, and she obviously was extremely emotional at this point. But this is what seemed to be that I noticed looking back at that, and this is what I think pictures this lamentation is she continued to cry this whole time for two hours as we were waiting for her husband to pick her up. And she's crying and she's screaming. And the longer that she did this crying, the more rhythmic, the more repetitive, and in a sense, the more musical this became. That is what a lamentation is. It is a dirge. It is a song for someone's death. And in this book, in this statement that we just read, this is the emotion that this is stated in. This is the heart of God. Intense sorrow, as if someone lost their child, or lost their spouse, or their parent. God is heartbroken over our sin. Yet even as Israel was guilty of whoring after false gods and idols, and they had forgotten everything that God had bestowed upon them, God still addressed them as a virgin. This was God's heart towards them. Intense sadness, yet still seeing how precious they were to him. When we see it sin, God mourns with this kind of sorrow, with this kind of feeling, as if he loses a child. And we are his child. And when we sin, we are separated from him. However, no matter how great the sin, the sacrifice of Jesus is sufficient. God will call us and see us as he did Israel, as pure. It pains God to see his children suffer the consequences of their poor decisions. Verse 3, For thus says the Lord, The city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out one hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. Now, this is in reference to sending men out for war. Sending out a thousand and only a hundred coming back. Or sending out that remaining hundred into battle and only ten returning. We will face wars and battles in our lives. This is unavoidable. It is definite. And it will happen until you die. There will be battles and struggles in your life. Sin will make you lose your battle. Brother Mike had preached a message here uh, a few uh, weeks back, probably a few months now, that it will ruin your steak dinner. It'll do more than that, too. It'll make you lose your battles. Sin will diminish your abilities. It will cut your power from a thousand to a hundred. 
And then when you go to use that 100 you have, it'll cut it to 10 in your own strength. Verse 4, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Seek me and live. If there's one verse or one phrase that is a sum up of this book, the pinnacle that everything else is jointed on in this book. It is this one verse. Seek me and live. Everything up to this point has led up to this verse. And everything else will hinge itself and be led from this verse that we will read. Seek me and live. So let's look at this a little bit. So seek Let's define seek here. In the Hebrew, formally, it would mean to tread or to frequent. But it means to follow or to per, for pursuit or to search for something. By implication, it means to seek and to ask, to specifically worship, to ask with care for, to ask diligently, to inquire and to ask Surely, seek me. And then, seek me and live. What is this word live? It means both to live figuratively and literally. But at its root, it means to be revived, to keep alive, to nourish up, to preserve, to be quickened, to recover, to repair, and to restore. So God's saying, seek, ask, diligently inquire, worship me, pursue me, and live. Be revived, be nourished, be preserved, be quickened, be repaired, and be restored. Verse 5, but not, do not seek, me, seek Bethel. And what is Bethel? Bethel was the city in the northern kingdom that became their replacement for Jerusalem. It was the religious center of the northern kingdom. Do not seek Bethel. Do not seek a religious system. And do not enter into Gilgal. Gilgal is where they crossed over Jordan and they put the 12 stones. We cannot flee from where we once were. And do not cross over to Beersheba. Beersheba was in the southern kingdom of Judah. And don't think that you can hide yourself among other people. You cannot hide your sin by just attending church. You cannot hide your sin by going to religious events. For Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. And he repeats himself again here. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out fire into the house of Joseph and devour it, with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. Let's concentrate on verse 7 here a moment. You who turn justice into wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. Too many times we're fed the lie and we hear that justice is wormwood or living by the word of God is a bitter life. But the truth is sin has no good thing at its end. All sin either leads to an early death or reduces our quality of life. The benefits of sin only have a short time that they are even a benefit. Lying may get you out of a pinch, but once your lie is exposed, the damage is normally worse than the pinch you were in the first time. Coveting. 
You know, the root of all advertisement and commercial is to make us covet. And this only creates wants and desires in your life that will never be fulfilled. You can never live a satisfied life running after things. You could almost define sin as you self-examine by looking at what things have good long-term effects and what have bad long-term effects. Sin always has a negative long-term effect. Verse 8. He who made Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into morning and darkness the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. God is truly the only one who is strong. He made the constellations. There's an interesting book. Uh, I believe my wife has a copy of it. And I think Pastor Hadley is the one that mentioned it in one of the Bible college classes about the, gospels in the, star, the gospel in the stars. And we're not uh, saying astrology is true or anything of that sort. But it's interesting that if you look at the constellations of the sky that God created, that the gospel message is actually written out on a sky chart. God will destroy anyone who believes himself to be strong because to believe yourself is strong is ultimately iniquity. They have entered into not just sin, but they've entered into evil, the sin of Satan coming in under the government of Satan. To believe you are strong or you can fix yourself or that you can do better or that you can earn your salvation is iniquity and destruction will flash forth against you. And Israel had fallen to this delusion in their prosperity because they believed that their labor and their effort had brought this prosperity upon their nations. And we must also always realize and keep it forefront in our mind, James 1.17, that every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Verse 10, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you excise tax of grain from him, you have built houses hewn of stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who affect the righteous who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for, in, for it is an evil time. They abhor him who speaks the truth. We will not be loved by the world, by a believer that we know that is living in sin. We will not be loved for giving them the truth. We will be hated for them. We'll be hated for speaking the truth many times. But we are to proclaim the truth. And this is part of, as we talked about, the, the um, process of divine discipline that is laid out here, that speaking the truth is part of that process. But there comes a time when it is prudent. We've said our peace. We've given God's message. There is a time that we must use prudence 
and be silent because the time is evil. There is a time to tell God's word and then there is also a time to shut up because we've given the information and it is time for the next process of God's divine discipline to take place, to bring that person to repentance. Verse 14, he says it a third time, phrased this way, Seek good, not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord God of hosts will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious on the remnant of Joseph. Now, Joseph is used many times. Joseph and Ephraim, symbolic to mean the northern ten tribes of Israel. And that's the context here. He's speaking of the nation of Israel here, the northern kingdom. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, in all the streets they shall say, alas, alas. They shall call the farmers to mourning, and to wailing those who are skilled in the lamentation. And in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst says the Lord. If a believer is in sin, there will be a time that God will pass through their midst. And when this happens, there will be intense sadness in this person's life. But there is the solution given here. Seek good, not evil. Verse 15, hate evil and love good, that it may be that the Lord will be gracious. When we repent and we seek God in our situation, He will be gracious upon us. Verse 18, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him and went into a house and leaned his hand against the wall, and the serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? Now on a high level or a macro level as we read this, and this book is absolutely to Israel, given by the prophet Amos. And he's speaking about end times things. And this is concerning the nation of Israel. The day of the Lord will come in darkness of the tribulation. And this is a divine discipline of God to bring that nation to repentance. But as we look for application here, as church people, Christians in the church today, remember what we said when we were studying Joel and this is paraphrased from Spirozodiades, defining what the day of the Lord is. It is any time the Lord openly intervenes into the affairs of men. And as we look at this, there will be tribulations in our life to bring us to repentance. And many times we may say, but if God would just do something about this or that, and if it's from our unrepented heart. It will be like this tribulation where you ran from a lion and ran straight into the arms of a bear and you ran into your house away from the bear only to be bitten by a snake. Verse 21, I hate, I despise your feast and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not accept them. And the peace offerings and your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your song. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters. 
and the righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And this is what the psalmist was talking about in Psalm 66, 18, where he says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. It is from our heart that God hears us, that he accepts our sacrifices of praise and our works in the New Testament times. If our works, if our songs, if any of these things are done while we're holding iniquity in our heart, it is just noise. And it will be those things at the judgment seat of Christ that goes up as wood, hay, and stubble. Verse 25. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years you were in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Skedeth, your king, in Kayan, your star god, your images that you made for yourselves. And I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And as we know, the northern tribes were conquered by Assyria, and they were scattered among all the nations. And as we come into closing tonight, seek the Lord and live. Our pinnacle verse here of this book. Seek the Lord and live, and seek good, not evil, that you may live. To seek, to ask, to be diligent, to diligently inquire, to worship and to pursue God. And live, to be revived, to be nourished, to be preserved, to be quickened, to be repaired and restored. And it can't be from the heart of Bethel, a religious system. And it can't be based on a heart of Gilgal based upon what was in our past. And we cannot cross over into Beersheba. We cannot hide our sin in our good works or in our singing or in church attendance of any of these things. But from that pure heart, we seek the Lord and live and seek good, not evil, that we may live.